Hello, hello, my lovely listeners. In case you missed the last episode, I wanted to remind you that we're now releasing episodes every other week instead of every week because my team and I are currently finalizing the new Fix Your Period Collective membership, and it is literally taking every bit of bandwidth that we've got. (laughs) I'll be telling you a whole lot more about it very soon, and you'll get the opportunity to take our new and vastly improved period quiz and get into your personalized period dashboard to see your answers and explanations in a very short time. So stay tuned for that. Okay, today's guest is Joy McCarthy. She's a holistic nutritionist and founder of joyoushealth.com. Joy is not just an expert in her field, she's also a beacon of inspiration for those navigating the often tumultuous journey of skin conditions, particularly rosacea. In this episode, we're going to explore Joy's personal journey with rosacea, how it influenced her passion for skin health, and the transformative impact managing rosacea naturally had on her confidence and overall well-being. Joy shares her extensive research and natural health perspectives on managing rosacea symptoms effectively, from ingredients to avoid in skincare to the impact of stress on skin conditions. We're basically going to cover it all. And Joy also walks us through all you need to know about the skin microbiome. We uncover the secrets of this often overlooked aspect of our bodies, understanding what it is, why it's crucial for skin health, and how this knowledge revolutionizes our approach to skin care. What disrupts the delicate balance of the skin microbiome, and how do we recognize the early signs of imbalance? Yep, Joy spills the beans on all of these things, including common elements that can alter or harm the skin microbiome, empowering us to take proactive steps towards natural treatment. We also cover the gut-skin connection, which is a topic close to Joy's heart, and she discusses the ways in which gut health impacts the condition of our skin. Stick around till the end where Joy summarizes the key steps to achieving healthy skin regardless of age. Plus, she shares additional advice and insights for all of you navigating your unique skin health journey. Hi, Joy. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. I am so thrilled to be talking to you about rosacea because as I was saying to you before we started recording, I've never really delved into this topic on the podcast. And when I think about rosacea, it kind of reminds me of melasma a little bit in the sense that that's Mm. what I've dealt with. I've never had rosacea, but I had melasma after being on the birth control pill. And it's Mm. always just a, well, you can try some topical things, but that's all we can really do for you. And so I always kind of felt like those two were very similar and that so many people have them, have these conditions, and yet there are not very many options. Do you feel the same way? It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? There are literally hundreds of millions of people who have rosacea and so many people don't even know, and they're actually treating it incorrectly. A lot of people think, especially if they have the rosacea, the type that's redness and bumps, they start treating it like acne and literally years or a decade will go by. They've been treating it incorrectly only to have it continue to get worse and worse. Oh no. Yeah. Okay. See, this is the problem though. I feel like across the board, it doesn't matter really what we're talking about. It could be period pain, it could be anything, right? right? It's the, the incorrect treatment protocols for these conditions. And thankfully we have you in our world. So I would love actually for you to talk about your own experience or your personal journey with rosacea and how you got to the point where uh, you were able to resolve it. Yeah, totally. So, um, I, so I had severe rosacea, which meant it started slowly though. It kind of creeps up on you. You know, I was always, I'm like the poster child. So first of all, rosacea is an inflammatory skin condition. And that means your skin is more sensitive. It tends to be more red, but in people of color, they actually can suffer from rosacea too. It's just not going to manifest as redness. Um, because if your skin is darker, obviously you don't see redness. Um, so for me personally, you know, I, I, since I was a child, have always been someone who blushes easily. So my skin has pink undertones. I'm of Celtic descent. Um, so I am like the poster child to develop rosacea. It's in my family as well. Uh, so, you know, I always, I always felt like my skin was kind of more pinky without it being like full blown rosacea. And then about, I want to say about five or six years ago, I started to notice the redness actually when I turned 40. Um, I noticed that it was just getting like the redness wouldn't go away. You know, it seemed that around my period, it might be or around ovulation, my skin would be a little bit more flushed, but then it got to a point where it wasn't going away. 
And then it kind of just very slowly continued to get worse and worse. So then it was like redness on my cheeks, redness on my chin. Then I started to get like the rosacea bumps, which are different than pimples and you can't treat them the same. They're just like these raised red bumps. So they don't ever actually form like a whitehead. They're just inflammatory. So like your skin texture, like trying to wear makeup, forget it to like cover rosacea because then your skin texture looks so bumpy and awful and it was it was really affecting my self-esteem i've never like i've always been such a positive optimistic person and i felt like really like hopeless and like depressed about it because i didn't even want to go take out my garbage because i'm a nutritionist how can i have like this massive skin problem so I kept trying to treat it naturally. I kept trying to do like natural things. And then I thought, you know what? So after I want to say about, I think it was around like the one and a half year mark, I thought I'm going to go and see a dermatologist and see what they have to say. So I just wanted to kind of have that in my toolkit so that, cause I was just feeling, I was like desperate to find something. Cause not only did it like look terrible, but it was really uncomfortable because there were times when I had would have really bad flare ups with rosacea it's very common that your skin feels really hot. And like my skin would feel like you could fry an egg on my cheeks, it was so hot so went to the dermatologist and. Of course, he, he recommended all the things I thought he was going to, including the birth control pill, which you would be horrified. <laughs> I've heard that so like, many times yeah, yeah he's like go on the birth control pill take an oral antibiotic for at least four months and take a, a pro sorry an antibiotic cream slather that on your face every day so oh. what do you think i did uh, none of not that, that. <laughs> no. they also don't I offer boys or men the birth control pill for their rosacea so right i'm like that right? should tell Great you point. it has nothing to do with our hormones <laughs> and well, everything yeah, to do with other things Exactly. And the funny thing was, he's like, um, the reason he recommended the birth control pill, because he was like, do you notice that it's a little worse, like around ovulation or your period? I'm like, yeah, my skin is more red. He's like, okay, then you need the birth control pill. And I'm like, okay, so I didn't do any of those things. And it just set me down the path of doing more research, scouring like every Reddit feed, every forum on rosacea, trying everything. And it was just, you know, it, it was so much trial and error. And that's why I'm so glad you asked me about this story because no two cases are the same, but there's some common elements between everybody that everyone needs to address. So if we fast forward, <laughs> essentially after about four years, I completely healed my skin. I have no bumps. The texture on my skin is perfect. I mean, there's no such thing as perfect skin. I don't even want to say that. I just, when I compare to what it was before, that being said, I'm always going to be someone who's prone to redness, probably halfway through this because I get excited and my face is going to be all red. But after when we get off the call and I have my lunch and I have a cup of tea, like the redness just leaves my skin. So for me, I, I figured out how to heal my skin naturally. Uh, and, you know, I, I thought I was going to have to go down the conventional route and I, I didn't, but it was truly a whole body approach. It wasn't just my skin, my skincare, which transformed my skin because I didn't understand about the acid mantle, which I'm sure we'll get into talking about gut health and inflammation. So it was all of those. It was truly a whole holistic, integrative approach that I use to uh, heal my skin from within. I feel like, first of all, the, we really have to move away from that, right? The move away from the, it's a topical thing. It's a skin thing. So that's the yes. only solution, right? Like you said, right. This, this took an immense amount of research and trial and error and experimentation, I'm sure. So yes. that's, I think is the key takeaway here for everybody is that you actually really have to think about what's going on below the surface. Um, and the second question I wanted to ask you was, when did this start? Like, did you have issues as a child or this was only in adulthood? Well, when I was a teenager, people used to say, oh, you look like you have rosacea. But that was just because I always, my skin, like, for example, if I did, um, I played different sports. When I played right. basketball, my skin would be beat red when I was hot. But that's, that's just me. However, it really kind of kicked off in like my late 30s kind of, I feel, I remember so distinctly, like when I turned 40, so I'm 46 at the end of this year. So, but I feel like that's when it got like really bad. That's when I noticed. So I feel like there's definitely a hormonal link, but that's not the only thing. There's also like gut health issues, 
skincare issues. I was using at the time natural stuff, but I didn't realize it wasn't the right, um, it wasn't right for my skin's pH. So Mm -hmm. yeah, like five, six years ago is I feel like when it was, it, it was like noticeably bad. But then when it started, the the amazing thing about the skin is, is that it heals so fast when you give your skin what it needs. Even just something as simple as, you see, I have my giant water here. This is like a liter of water. Yeah, okay, we're like mason jar twinsies. (laughs) Um, Just something as simple as water. Like if you, for your listeners, if you drink like two of these, so like two liters a day, just within a couple days, if your skin is dry or more sensitive and you start drinking more water, within a couple of days, you're going to notice the difference. So the skin is so responsive. That's the great thing. That's the great thing and also not the great thing, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we have to remember both ends of water. the spectrum. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, well, I know I wanted to really talk about the skin microbiome, right? Like we all know yeah. what the gut microbiome is and well, hopefully you do if you've been hanging around here with yes. me for any length of time, right? But um, let's talk about the skin microbiome. Like what is it? Yeah. Why is it crucial for skin health? Yeah, totally. It's a great question. So it sounds like your listeners probably know about the gut microbiome because they listen to your podcast and you talk about that a lot. Hopefully. So as they, as you know, the gut microbiome is home to trillions of microbes. So so too, the skin microbiome, we literally have microorganisms all over our entire body. Some areas of our body have different kinds, different species, different amounts. So for example, your armpits are going to have slightly different species than your face has because your armpits, you know, you sweat and you smell. It's the bacteria that live in your armpits that make you smell. It's not that you have smelly sweat. Well, you do, but it's the bacteria (laughs) sort of combining with the sweat of your body that actually causes the smell. So there's two very important roles. So the skin microbiome is just essentially the microbes that live on your skin. And there's kind of like two very important roles of the skin microbiome. One of them is to regulate inflammation And the other one is that it's part of the skin barrier function in that it uh, forms a protective barrier. So it helps to, um, it acts as a barrier against foreign bacteria, viruses, uh, pollutants, allergens, yeast, anything that could kind of disrupt the skin or make your skin feel more sensitive. The microbiome is protecting your skin from that, just like the gut microbes that live in your gut work symbiotically with your immune cells to identify between friend and foe. As we know, your gut um, is incredible for keeping your, 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 the microbes that live in your gut are so important for having a healthy immune system. And the skin, by the way, is part of your immune system. So the skin microbiome is to regulate inflammation and to be that barrier of defense to literally protect your skin. So when people say they have really sensitive skin, it's actually sometimes more accurate to say your skin is sensitized because not everyone actually has, they may be experiencing sensitive skin, but it's more that there may be an issue going on with the skin microbiome and therefore you don't have that protective barrier to prevent you from reacting to everything from like the pollen outside to the dust in your home. Uh, So yeah, it's, it's incredibly important. I think it's so overlooked, but I think like skincare now, I feel like I'm starting to see like some skincare brands, you know, really consider the skin microbiome and the importance of that and of supporting that, which is really great. Yeah, no, I think that there has been a massive shift in in not only skincare companies, but all of them uh, in terms yes. of like their ingredients and things like that. Um, so is this true that if you looked at your skin under like a major microscope, you would just see like lots of little microbes yeah. <laughs> just all yeah, over exactly. your skin? Even I think people yeah, can't and you even know wrap their head around that. Yeah, um, you basically have creepy crawlies all over your body, just like you have these creepy crawlies all over your, all in your gut. And, you know, some are beneficial and some are not so beneficial. It's not about wiping out all the bad stuff because just like your gut, they can all live together in harmony. Um, And in fact, there's, you know, new research even on the gut microbiome saying that there's actually no bad bacteria, that even like the undesirable bacteria in your gut may actually have some purposes. It's just about um, having 
the right balance and having a diversity. And so just like, you know, all scientists agree that a healthy microbiome is one with lots of diversity. And the same goes for the skin microbiome. A healthy skin microbiome is one with lots of different microbes. Cause we know in studies in people who have acne, eczema, there's often an altered skin microbiome and they have too much of one kind and too little diversity overall. And there's so many reasons um, that that can happen and you can end up having skin issues uh, because, because your skin microbiome has been altered. Yeah, of course. And now that makes me think of, we'll get into some of those issues and some of those elements that cause the skin microbiome uh, dysbiosis. But I am curious about uh, the part around birth and how we inherit so much of our mother's mm, yeah. microbiome. Is that similar for the skin microbiome potentially? Yeah, okay. I love that question. So I'm a mom and when I had my daughter Vienna, um, when she was born, I actually did not bathe her for an entire week because I was able, I'm, I was able to have a vaginal birth and I knew the importance of my microbes and the vernex, which is like kind of like white stuff on her. Of course we like wiped her down, <laughs> but we didn't, <laughs> that'd be kind of gross if we didn't. <laughs> However, you know, it's so commonplace in hospitals to take the baby away and basically give them like a little wash. Yeah. So yes, that's the first, um, well, actually it's interesting because there's some research now saying it's kind of controversial whether um, we are exposed to microbes in utero or is the first exposure when we travel through the birth canal. So scientists yes. actually kind of disagree. In my brain, it seems intuitive to me that you would be exposed to the mother's microbiome within um, within the, like when you're in the womb. Yeah. But I'm not a scientist, so I can't speak with confidence on that. However, we do know that when you are, if you have a child then you're able to give birth vaginally, that's amazing because that is the first sort of inoculation of those microbes all over the skin, which help form the skin's immune system and also help to train that baby to recognize that foreign bacteria, viruses are not a bad thing. And interestingly, antibiotics can really affect that when women, uh, pregnant women take antibiotics, um, that can also affect their child's skin health. And it's been shown in research that more babies and children have a greater risk of both asthma and eczema as babies and children when their mother has been exposed to antibiotics. So, which is kind of like a tsunami for your microbes. Like that's like the worst, I mean, the worst thing. However, of course, like antibiotics do save lives. So in some cases, you know, if you're pregnant and you have a horrible infection and that is what you need to do, that's, that's what you need to do. But it's just interesting to note that, that, you know, a pregnant woman, she can impact her baby's skin microbiome when she's pregnant. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I could not agree with you more on this. I feel like I have a really good friend who tested positive for strep B. Is it strep B? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you know, she was yes. pregnant and she took the antibiotics, but didn't want to, and was really struggling with whether to do it or not. Um, just because she understands that there's a potential downstream impact and right. her daughter had so has had so many skin issues. Uh, oh my gosh. It's just sort of, never ending. yeah, I know. And it started from the, really from the very beginning. So it just makes you wonder, I mean, she's just obviously one person, but it does really make you wonder like how many women are taking antibiotics during pregnancy and what is this right. doing? And, and are we studying these kinds of things? I'm not sure that we can, uh, from a moral mm -hmm. perspective. So yeah, it's right. just yeah. food for thought for anyone who may have experienced something like this. I feel like. Yeah, no, it's a really great question worth talking about for sure. Yeah. And so in addition to things like that, what are some other common elements that can alter uh, or harm that skin microbiome? Yeah, so many different things. Um, your own personal hygiene, you know, if you are a super sanitizer, you know, we saw this a lot in the pandemic, <laughs> people using so much alcohol-based hand sanitizer. And I get it, you're wanting to like kill microbes, but the problem is you need that microbiome to be that barrier so that you don't get eczema and dry skin. Mm -hmm. So from a, you know, what we use topically on our body can alter our skin microbiome, um, how our environment, uh, what we eat can impact our skin microbiome via our gut health because our gut is linked to our skin microbiome. 
Our stress levels, we already know that stress alters the microbes in our gut. Um, people have less diverse gut microbes when under stress. And we know that there's a bio, bi-directional relationship between the gut microbes and the skin. They kind of talk to each other basically. So what impacts the gut? If the gut has inflammation, it can, um, it can stimulate skin inflammation as well. Um, so I think I went off on a tangent there. What, oh, you're just circling all back different, to your question. All the different things that can impact the skin microbiome. Oh yeah, also, <laughs> um, yeah. So we talked about stress, um, antibiotics, of course, whether taken internally or topically, because that's kind of like a tsunami for your good bacteria and bad bacteria kind of wipes everything out. The pH of your skin, like what are you using to cleanse your skin? Are you altering that skin pH? That's really, really important. Like the acid mantle of your skin. A lot of people don't realize that. And um, excessive. Can you, can you talk a lot about of people, that? The acid mantle. Yes. Can you share what that is? Yeah, 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 totally. So your skin, your skin has a pH that's a little bit more acidic. And a lot of products out there, soap is way too alkaline. And a lot of products either have soap or they have SLS. They like foaming cleansers, for example, really alter and bring the um, skin microbiome and the acid mantle, make it too uh, alkaline. And that's not good. It needs to be a little bit more acidic so that it is not, um, so that the skin microbes uh, can exist in harmony and it can repel bad bacteria, viruses, that type of thing. Oh. So you're, I feel like this is such an undertapped um, area of skin health, your acid mantle. I feel like even in natural skincare too, because I feel like a lot of natural skincare products, uh, if it's, you know, just some sort of like milk, like a coconut milk based cleanser, which is so alkaline. If you're using that every single day, it's actually not good. You need to be, this is why toners are so important, making sure you use like a good toner that can help to balance out that acid mantle. So just no like, idea. I mean, I'm sure you talk about this with gut health. Like you don't, you lots of people have low stomach acid uh, and they're not properly breaking down their proteins and not um, breaking down minerals properly. So it's like, there's so many, um, what's the word, similarities between gut health and skin health. They're kind of like really one in the same. And you really, if someone has skin health issues, you always have to address gut health too. Even if someone's like, oh, but I don't feel like I have gut health issues. I'm not constipated. I'm not, I don't have bloating or, you know, that type of thing. There's, there's always, there's always something going on. There's always the link. Oh, I agree completely. It's so funny when people say that to me, but I don't have any gut health issues. I'm like, trust me, a lot of people who have yeah. gut health issues don't. There could be something going on. Gut health issues. Um, okay. So that's all really interesting. This acid mantle is kind of blowing my mind. Um, we're going to come back to that because <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I have a we few totally more questions can. I can talk it. to you. Yeah. about how to like care for your, your acid mantle, like what, like what products, what products to use oh, we're, and yeah, just we're keeping gonna get it simple. That. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Keeping it simple, I think is really key. I think that that's exactly it, right? Is that it seems to have gotten really overcomplicated. It feels like in terms oh, of like what we should be doing no for kidding. our skincare. Yeah, I know. So I'm overwhelmed just thinking about it, but um, let's talk about, uh, aside from rosacea, are there, uh, I, I feel like there are obviously other signs yeah. and symptoms uh, that indicate that your skin microbiome is off kilter. Can you share? Yeah, about yeah, those? totally. Basically. Yeah. Any skin can, any skin condition, whether it's any type of dermatitis, um, which is essentially just an inflammation, eczema, acne, psoriasis, every single skin condition can be traced back to the skin microbiome. It doesn't mean that that every skin condition is a result of an altered microbiome, but the skin microbiome is going to be involved, but also like dry, flaky skin, skin that is overly sensitive to environmental triggers. Like a lot of people will complain in the cold, in the cold and the wind or extreme heat that really negatively affect, affects their skin. And that would be a sign that your skin microbiome is altered. Uh, if your skin is uh, overly red or just sensitive, um, essentially 
if your skin is inflamed, uh, then that tells you for sure that there's something going on with your skin microbiome, because as we talked about, that's one of the major roles of the skin microbiome is to really um, regulate inflammation. So basically any skin disorder, anything that's ever going on with, wrong with your skin can be traced back. Also aging, we're now learning there's new interesting research as well, how our gut microbiome influences our body's aging. So I, um, how quickly our body, body ages, I imagine in the future, we're going to see more research on the skin microbiome's impact on how quickly your age, you age, which kind of makes sense because if you think, you know, as you get older and estrogen declines, especially like in perimenopause, a lot of women in their forties, um, and even like a lot of women now, I'm sure you talk about on your podcast in your, in their thirties are, you know, kind of go, going into early perimenopause. And as that happens, our hormones decline progesterone, estrogen, estrogen, what is what keeps our skin like so juicy and moisturized. So as you age and you're producing less of those hormones, that in of itself is going to alter the skin microbiome because the lipid barrier of your skin barrier is so important for those microbes to be happy. Like if your skin is dry and just lacking moisture, that is also going to impact your skin microbiome. And that happens just naturally as a process of aging. That's why you got to adjust things diet wise, um, natural health supplement wise and skincare uh, in your thirties and then sort of beyond. Oh girl, as you were saying that forties and estrogen, I'm like, oh, give me all the estrogen. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I'm, one, I'm one of those people who's sort of estrogen has just got it taken a slow decline in my 40s. And I'm like, oh, I just need some. Oh, more you're in estrogen. your 40s. Oh, my gosh. Yes. I thought you were so much younger. Oh, no, girl. I'm 44. I'm old. <laughs> Good for you. You look fantastic. 44 is not old, though. I know. I know. It's I'm, not, I'm, right? I'm it's... fine. I'm happy. I'm happy with yeah. 44. I feel like so you're probably... I paid my dues to get here. <laughs> I'm feeling yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Oh my gosh. You know, I, there was something else I was thinking about too. Um, when you were talking about just healing your own rosacea, do you feel like recognizing these signs and symptoms or these conditions early enough um, can really help in the treatment of them? Do yes. You feel like, yeah. So do you feel like there's a much easier resolution if you get to it earlier versus waiting? Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I've had, um, I've had people reach out over the years on social media who said they had like severe rosacea and then they listened to my podcast on rosacea and made some changes and they can't believe how much better their skin is. So I would say, yes, it's always better to address it earlier, but it doesn't mean that if you've had rosacea, like some people are like, I've had it for 20 years. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you've had this for 20 years. You've been putting up with this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like never too late, but yes, of course, like, you know, the body is always giving us signs and symptoms, right? That's this is our body's way of telling us something is off. If my skin is always irritated or if I ex have eczema or I have acne, there's something going on internally. You know, it's great we're having this conversation because we really want to change that mindset of like, oh, it's everything topical. But we also want to be careful not to say that it's only internal because it's actually both. You have to consider how you treat the outside of your skin Skin. And if you're having skin issues, you have to consider the inside. Um, and it's an inside out approach, but it's also an outside in. It's basically both is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yes, exactly. That whole body approach you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, so are there, well, I guess we should start with like practical ways to start caring for your skin, yeah. care, caring for the acid mantle. Maybe we'll start there and then we'll get into the gut stuff. Yeah. Okay. So if you are using a cleanser that has SLS, that means it's a foaming cleanser. You need to stop using that right now, please. Even if you have acne uh, prone or oily skin, because those types of harsh cleansers really strip that lipid barrier and alter the pH of your skin, making it more alkaline. So please just don't use those like harsh foaming cleansers, anything with SLS. Also uh, look to your products. Are you using stuff with fragrance or preservatives? Um, like really look at all the list of ingredients and use products that support your skin microbiome, which in doing so is going to support that um, fatty acid mantle. And also make sure you use a toner. Toners, so many people don't realize how important a toner is before your serum because it helps to balance 
your pH helps to balance and tone your skin. It doesn't mean, I think, I know when I used to think of a toner, I used to think of something that was like an astringent and was gonna make my skin feel tight and dry. It should not feel like that. It should make your skin feel refreshed. So use a toner always before your serum or your moisturizer because um, when you use a toner on your skin first, then you enhance the absorption of your serum because your skin needs to be a little bit wet and then your your serum or your moisturizer can get to work and and really do its job. So you know, cleanse. Use a natural cleanser with gentle ingredients, nothing that's stripping your skin. Tone, and then use your serum or or your moisturizer. So that's really key for supporting the pH of your skin. But if we want to go beyond that, like supporting your skin microbiome, you know, nutrition is so key like what we put into our body will have a direct impact on our skin because our 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 gut regulates inflammation in our body so if we are eating a lot of inflammatory foods the our gut sends molecules to the skin that like say like hey inflammation and by the way inflammation isn't just redness inflammation can be anything it can like inflammation is at the root of so many conditions whether it's acne, whether it's aging, you may have heard of inflammaging, increased inflammation in the body increases aging in the body, on the skin, inside the body. So, so the first place to start with nutrition is like, look at your diet, right? Like a seven day food journal and then assess, okay, how many inflammatory foods am I eating? Sugar is the biggest inflammatory food out there. So, and I think a lot of people don't realize how many hidden sources of sugar they're eating. You know, they might have a bowl of cereal or granola with some Greek yogurt for breakfast and they don't realize that that's cereal or even the yogurt is just loaded with sugar or the sauces that they use um, on their stir fry or on their pasta. You know, it's just like loaded with sugar. I mean, there's obvious sources of sugar, baked goods, candies, but sugar is so inflammatory and it really, I know you talk a lot about this, but can alter uh, that it can cause dysbiosis when you're feeding the bad bacteria, the yeast, the fungi, all like the yucky stuff, the parasites, they love sugar. They're just sugar hogs. And so that can really alter your gut microbiome, which increases inflammation in the body. So from a nutritional perspective, eat an anti-inflammatory diet if you really want to support the health of your skin. Yeah, and it's such such good advice. And I feel like Oftentimes we just look to more and more complicated things to address, mm -hmm. whether it's our skin problems or some other health issue. But I feel like I'm I'm boring in that I'm just constantly saying like the low hanging fruit, ladies, this is what yeah. you need to do. And the sugar, right. I think, true. is a huge problem. It's so inflaming. Yeah. And, and alcohol. Yeah. Oh, too. God. Another yeah. one, like the daily drinking wine yeah. is so inflammatory. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm a non-drinker, uh, but I just think a lot of women who, and women, so by the way, rosacea and these inflammatory skin conditions are more common in women. I feel that, you know, if you have a skin condition or you want to age slower, you want to prevent premature aging, then really, you know, looking at how much alcohol you drink, because that, that's sugar and so inflammatory. And right. yeah, and then that alcohol is so problematic for your liver detoxification pathways. Right. And of course, like the gut microbiome plays a huge role in how the liver is functioning, how the gallbladder is functioning. So right. I feel like you know, we think about the gall or the gut microbiome and the gut function in general, but then we're not really even realizing that the liver and the gallbladder are such huge parts of that whole digestive process and that we yes. need to actually get those toxins out of our bodies. And that's the way we do it. And if those aren't working, then, you know, like we're stuck in this cycle of like chronic acne or whatever, you know, or rosacea. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And with those, you know, when you're eating more anti-inflammatory foods, not only are you helping to lower those inflammatory chemicals in your body, but you're also feeding your gut microbes. You know, if you really focus on um, eating lots, eating a wide variety of colorful fruits and vegetables, that will mean you get more phytonutrients. Phyto means plant nutrient and phytonutrients. Many, there's a whole class of phytonutrients, polyphenols and polyphenols aren't really food for us, nutrients for us. They're actually, they actually feed our gut microbes and they're very anti-inflammatory. So a simple way to um, shop for your groceries is to always make sure when you're buying your fruits and vegetables, 
buy like the full rainbow of colors every week because phytonutrients are what give foods their taste, their texture, and their color. So if you buy a lot of different colors, you get a lot of different phytonutrients and therefore you're getting lots of different nutrients to really feed your gut microbiome. Plus you're getting, you know, so many different nutrients that are going to help you have healthy skin. Like we know vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C are so important for healthy skin as well. So anti-inflammatory diet to focus on and eat lots of colorful when it comes to plant foods eat lots of colorful foods within a week like try and eat you know on your plate when you 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 know have dinner at night a minimum of three colors at least least. (laughs) you know green orange yellow or green red like there's you know there's Purple. and sweet potatoes are my favorite right now. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> Give right? me all the sweet potatoes, yeah. all the root vegetables at this moment because I'm so yes. cold. Um, yes, totally. You know something you said earlier about uh, soaps. Um, I guess just yeah. like regular body soaps and whatnot being problematic because they're so alkaline. So yes. what do you use? What what does one do about this yeah, situation? Yeah, you know what? There's actually. Did you ever read that book? I have it somewhere. Um, It's about that guy. I'm forgetting what it's called, but it's about that guy who like stopped having a shower. Yes. Do you know about this book? I do. Well, my father-in-law was reading it funnily enough and we had a whole conversation about it. (laughs) And so, yes, I've been meaning to read it ever since our conversation, but you can give me the clip notes. You know what? Not that I'm recommending like never shower again, but he's definitely on to something. Your skin might, so me personally, I only wash the dirty bits. I never use I, like body wash to me is like horrifying. <laughs> like, you know what? People are always asking me, Joy, why don't you develop a body wash? I'm like, because I don't recommend one. I don't want, I don't care how much you want me to create a clean one. Please stop using body wash and those big loaf of sponges on your body when you have a shower. Just stop. You know, just get like a plain, the plainest bar of soap from a health food store without any fragrance and just wash your private bits. That's it. And just let the water, like that's all, that's all you need. Like people, you know, so many people, it's just like so hard for them to get their head around that. But when you do it, you're going to have such, your skin is going to be so much healthier. So yeah, don't use soap on your body. Definitely don't use bar soap on your face. That's like, I remember when I was a kid, I would use like ivory soap on my face. uh, And then my skin would be so tight. And remember when we would think like tight, dry skin, so many people have that in their head. It would right? hurt. Yes. And then you insane. think, oh, my skin is so healthy. And then you put moisturizer on that. It's like red and like, like irritated. Um, yeah. That tight, dry skin is not a sign of clean skin. That's a sign that you have stripped the fatty layer of your skin. You've altered your skin microbiome. Not what you want to be doing. I know I sound extreme here, but I'm just so anti like body wash and using soaps. Yeah. They're just way too, way too alkaline. And the fragrances, I imagine, too, are problematic. Well, yeah, the fragrance, because when fragrance is added to a cosmetic or a beauty product, this can mean hundreds of different chemicals. And if you're sensitive at all, you're not going to know precisely what you may be sensitive to. The other problem is when fragrance is added to a product, this automatically means synthetic fragrance. It automatically means there's phthalates in there. That's a funny word that starts with a P. And phthalates are hormone disrupting chemicals, and they are literally what give fragrance their ability to stay like you know when you like hug someone and then you like smell your shirt and you're like oh i can smell them on me (laughs) that's thanks to phthalates because phthalates are plastic molecules that adhere scent to you uh so that's why i'm very anti-fragrance anytime you see a label that says fragrance or perfume just don't just don't even use it it and put that yeah and then preservatives like a lot of people don't think about this for skincare, but what is a preservative's job? A preservative's job, just like when you see it in food, is to prevent mold, prevent bacteria growth. Okay, so then you're slathering your face with this anti-wrinkle cream that has all these preservatives. Like this is altering your skin microbiome, just like when you eat foods with lots of preservatives. What's that, what's that doing to your gut microbiome as well? parabens are another one. So there's a lot of hormone disrupting chemicals um, found in skincare and even of course found in foods as well. So just like people are good at, I feel like reading their food labels, you want to read your skincare labels too. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Are there any other ingredients, by the way? Because I know that skincare or the industry yeah. generally is pretty unregulated, right? Oh, yes. It's very, yeah. it's very unregulated. So the problem with the phthalates that I just mentioned, they're not often listed. But no, they're, they're found not at all. under other chemicals. Yeah, there's um, all sort. Okay, so you know what's really interesting? That's a good question because I want to say about 10, 15 years ago, there was all like the hype around parabens. So like all these companies go paraben free. Yeah. And so great, you've gone paraben free, but what are you doing to preserve because you're wanting shelf life to be maintained for five years in that moisturizer? So what these companies did was greenwashing. They put paraben free on the label, then they put all these formaldehyde releasers. So formaldehyde releasing compounds. Uh, and there's a lot of well, uh, there's a, a lot of them. What I can do is and I can send you a link if you want to share in the show notes um, yeah. to the different formaldehyde releasing compounds. So they just added those up as preservatives, then they can say paraben free. That's why whenever I see a product that says paraben free, I would never buy it. Because if a company, if that is their only claim to make you think that they are clean, then you know that there is a lot of other crap in there. So paraben free is the biggest greenwashing term. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, the clean beauty companies that are saying paraben free doesn't mean they're not clean. But you know what? Most companies, if, if, if it's a truly a clean product, it's going to say so much more than paraben free. So when right. you see that paraben free that should trigger you to say, okay, well, like what's actually in this and focus on like, I'm all about skinimalism, few products, few ingredients. I love that term. It kind of reminds me of the whole BPA free movement, yes. right? Because yeah. they just used BPB, I believe and yeah, BPC, BPS. right? BPS. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. I know. The same so thing. Same, same thing. Basically the same thing. I know. It's just sort of like a replacement with something that's the same or potentially worse. It sucks. Yeah, yeah it totally exactly. sucks. Um, and coming back to just the practical ways that you were talking about, are there supplements? Like what supplements do you typically recommend? Obviously, this isn't you giving advice in any way, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are on, on supplements to support skin health. Yeah, I think supplements are fantastic because there's always going to be sort of nutritional gaps in our diet and our our food, even if we eat like a really wholesome, nourishing, wholesome, nourishing diet, uh, you know, our foods are just not as nutritionally dense as they were 50, 60 years ago. So I think that there's always going to be gaps in our diet. When it comes to supplements, though, I think it's so individual. It really depends on what someone is kind of going through. But I would say one of my favorite sort of underrated skincare supplement is GLA. And that's the fatty acid you find in things like hemp um barrage oil so i personally take a gla supplement every day so it's from barrage uh the barrage seed and the reason i like gla so much for skin health is because it's been shown to help increase uh, the moisture in your skin um, help reduce inflammation within the body. But very specifically, there's been research done on GLA and skin benefits. So if someone's listening to this has dry skin, inflamed skin, if they have eczema, if they find that they're drier in the winter, GLA from barrage oil is a really great place to start. I'm a really big fan. Uh, vitamin D as well, especially this time of year. Um, a deficiency sign of vitamin D is dry skin. So that's an, and of course, if someone has more oily skin or acne prone skin, vitamin D is wonderful because it's very anti-inflammatory as well. Mm. Uh, so those are the top two GLA, vitamin D, uh, what else? Quercetin, another underrated supplement, especially for people. I know we didn't even go into this. This is a whole other topic, but uh, histamine, like how well are you breaking down? Histamine can be a root cause. One of the root causes actually of rosacea and many right. other conditions. If your gut is not breaking down histamines properly, what does histamines do? They are vasodilators. So it's gonna bring more, that's going to mean more redness and irritation in your skin. So there, so that's, so circling back to why I mentioned quercetin because quercetin inhibits the release of histamines. And so if your gut's not breaking them down or you're eating too many foods that are elevating, that are high in histamines or or boosting histamines, then quercetin is a phytonutrient that will inhibit that release. That was a big thing for me with my rosacea. I still take um, quercetin every day. And that's something you find in onions, apples, turkey. Um, it's a really very, very anti-inflammatory uh, phytonutrient. And it's like considered an, a natural antiviral as well. 
So those are three. I can keep going. I like, mean, those are of- really great. I know. I think those are so great. It's true. We didn't really get too much into histamine, but I feel like that's like a good, but a little summary. And I, I feel like ultimately you've got to deal with what's causing the histamine problem in the first place. Yes. And you really did talk about that. Like exactly. you've got to be looking at the gut and figuring exactly. out yeah, what's going on there. Cause obviously there are multiple contributors to that, but I feel like that's also oh. helpful. Tell me what do you yeah, got? I want to add one more. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. How did I forget the collagen? Oh, I'm a huge Yes. I'm a huge fan. It is worth the hype. I'm a huge fan of collagen. The great thing about collagen is that it helps to boost your skin's hydration. So it's interesting because all the studies that have been done on collagen that talk about, you know, it, it's like an anti-aging supplement and it helps your skin be more youthful and more radiant. And that is literally because it's helping your skin retain more moisturize, more moisture. And that's why it can help us look more youthful because when our skin is really dry, uh, you see wrinkles so much easier. So collagen, I personally notice a big difference in my own skin. I was taking marine collagen uh, for a while. And then when I actually switched to um, grass fed, uh, like uh, bovine collagen, Mm -hmm. big difference. I noticed a really big difference in my skin hydration. So I'm a big fan. I'm a really big fan of collagen. And I, you know, I recommend a lot. Some people like, like the flavored ones. I just like plain, I like put it in my tea and I don't even use like a full, I don't use a full scoop. Most of the research is on around 10 grams of collagen per day for the skin health benefits. Uh, And because I'm frugal, I just use like half a scoop, which is like five grams a day and it's fine. It, yeah. it totally, and with all supplements, I take breaks too. I don't just like, right. you know, take a gazillion things all the time. It's good to take breaks from stuff too. But I found like it also made my skin softer. Uh, are you a fan of collagen? Yeah. You have great I, skin. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I don't really know why. <laughs> my mom has really good skin. So I feel like that might have something to do with it. Oh yeah, for sure. sure. Genetics play a role. Yeah. But like you, you know, I, I, I you said you're alcohol free. Like I rarely drink, you know, I've really, been careful about sugar and all of these other things for a really long time. So, you know, it's just like, it all sort of adds up over time, I imagine. Um, Mm -hmm. But yes, I really like collagen. um, Although I find that I I tend to taste it too much. So I really can only put it in soups. Yeah. Some people say that. Yeah. Yeah. I really do. Um, I don't taste it. I don't know. I I know my mother-in-law drinks it and loves it. And she just puts it in water. And I'm like, how do you do that? In water? Okay. I feel like I taste it in water, but you know what? I, you know, in fairness though, I will put it in a strong tasting tea. Right. So maybe that's that's what like, yeah, something that is like um, either peppermint-y or gingery, then, then you don't really taste it. So you know what? I should, my husband's a big coffee snob. I should sneak it in his coffee <laughs> and see if he notices actually It'd be an interesting little experiment. I could do the same to mine. I actually feel like he could use some collagen. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that would be, I, you know, I think it's interesting though, what you said about the Marine versus the, uh, what was it like a grass fed type of collagen? Yeah. Or grass fed beef. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you, you found what, that though, that was a big difference. In- Yeah, but in the research, it kind of is like on par. It's not really some, I feel like I see on social media, some people say marine is way better for skin. But actually, when you look at the research, it's actually kind of, they're kind of the same. They're kind of on par. The studies are on par. But for me personally, I just noticed a difference. I really did. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I, lots of people that I know prefer grass fed. It's just, you know, a lot of people don't talk about that because they think, okay, it's just not, you can get sustainably sourced. Right. But you know, I, I think a lot of people just think that the Marine is more sustainable, but I think it just really depends on the brand. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know that any of it's that much more sustainable (laughs) ultimately. Yeah, Yeah, I know there's that. Um, what about colostrum? Wait, is that uh, something that people use? Is it for their skin? I've only sort yeah, of you know, briefly gotten an introduction to it, but I don't know much. And I was like, maybe I'll try this supplement and see. But I really you know what? I don't it. know. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know much about colostrum when it comes to skin care, skin health. But have you? Uh, I don't I know. Mean, for I some people, reason, it yeah, seems just... so weird to me. <laughs> I don't. I have not taken it as a supplement. I don't know why it seems so weird. Maybe it's because I breastfed, and I'm just like that is just so weird. But I. But at the same time, so is it something you take? It's not something I take. I've just okay. sort of looked into it very briefly. So I thought I'd yeah. ask you because I wasn't entirely no, sure I'm whether that was in your wheelhouse at all. Um, yeah, I know. No, I'm but now I'm curious. gonna look it up. 
I'm kind of yeah, curious. Yeah, I'm very yeah. curious because yeah. I do know I have some friends who take it, but I've never really been like, now, why are you taking that? And where is that? Where is that colostrum from? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. Well, y- the there source? is a brand I keep getting hit with these. The ad targeting on Facebook these days is pretty oh. impressive. And so, of course, yeah. I get these I get hit with these ones. And so there is a brand, I think it's Armra, at least in the US. Okay. And uh, and so they talk about how they they source it. It's apparently overflow. Again, I'm not okay. entirely sure. Like, I don't really know the deal. Um, I've got to look more into it. But I am curious because you read the reviews on this stuff and yeah. people are just like singing its praises. So, Going nuts. All right. I mean, I'm yeah, really it's really this. interesting. <laughs> As you uh, get know older, what's you're funny? kind of like, I'm looking for the next thing. What is it? <laughs> Yeah. You know what though? As soon as we get off this call and then like when I go on my like Google search or something, or I'm on my phone, you bet I'm going to get like an ad <laughs> for You 100% colostrum. are. Literally you are. <laughs> we were literally just talking about our dogs because our one of our dogs has like dark, um, like eyeliner looking like around oh, her eyes. Cute. And so we were just talking about that two days ago. And I literally get one of those suggested posts on Instagram. And this is this girl making her eye makeup to look like her dog's eyes and talking all about it. And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Is this really happening right now? Wow. <laughs> I know this is where we're at guys. That's this funny, but at. also very creepy. <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> it's just terrifying. Oh my gosh. Anyways, we've gone way off the subject matter, but I just want to, I want to wrap up and say, thank you so much. This was absolutely amazing. And I would love if you have any sort of words of wisdom for anyone who's really struggling with their skin, like mm. thoughts, parting thoughts, that would be amazing. Don't give up. You're going to get through this. There's only one way through. There's only one way, right? Just keep going. I think that's the biggest thing I know. Like I think back to when I was so like depressed about this and felt like so helpless. And it was just like, like, try, try something new. Like if you're always doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, then it's time to like change it up try something new, whether it's like, you know, try adding something new to your diet, a new supplement, um, work. Do you work with, are you practically, like, do you work with people one-on-one? Yeah. Yeah. Like go look for a natural health care practitioner that can help you. Cause so many people are just trying to figure it out themselves and you know, you don't have to do that either. Like work with someone like you or someone, you know, who is an expert in whatever skin issue you have and, and keep, keep going forward. Cause you'll get there. Honestly, I felt like my case was so bad. I felt like I was never going to get there. I was just like, I had beautiful, perfect skin until my late thirties. And then boom, I was like, I'm never going to have nice skin again. And I came through the other side and now I can talk about it. So even, you know, if someone, if you, even if your listener has been dealing with something for, for decades, you know, you'll, you'll get there. Just try something different. Thank you so much. Thank you for saying that. I feel like the words of encouragement are always so helpful for someone who is just mired in it and doesn't sort of Mm. see a way through. So thank you. And also, can you just talk about your resources? Because everyone needs to find you if they're struggling with this stuff, because it is obviously it requires, like you said, a really multifaceted approach. Totally. So uh, if your listener is listening because of rosacea or any sort of inflammatory skin issue, I would say go to, I don't normally recommend this, but my TikTok, (laughs) I am very precise on TikTok about the things I talk about with regards to skin. So you can find me Joyous Health. And also on Instagram, I post a lot of reels, Joyous Health as well. Uh, I have a podcast called the Joyous Health Podcast and uh, my website, joyoushealth.com. I've got tons of resources there uh, and health the hundreds and hundreds of free recipes because I have three cook I have three cookbooks but beyond my cookbooks I've got so many free recipes so if you're looking to eat in more anti-inflammatory based diet but you want food to still taste good then joyoushealth.com for yummy recipes amazing joy thank you so much this was an amazing conversation I really appreciate Yay. your time yeah I love chatting with you Nicole thank, thank you. you that's a wrap Be sure to click that subscribe button to join me for more Girl Talk Gone Menstrual in upcoming episodes. But in the meantime, check out my latest period party episode. And if you're looking for a deeper dive into your hormones, go ahead and take my period quiz at nicolejardim.com slash quiz.